interesting program as part of our kind of a COVID-19 series. Um, I know those of you who have joined us uh, throughout this last year 
uh, have uh, witnessed some uh, COVID updates from uh, uh, healthcare professionals. And uh, late last year, we also started talking about mental health issues. So today is part of that um, kind of mental health, looking at mental health issue. How are we gonna stay resilient during this time of COVID? And we have two um, great Hong Kongers, uh, both uh, joining us from Hong Kong and, uh, and, and I'm really eager to hear from them. Uh, we have Vivek Malvani, one of Hong Kong's top comedians, both English and Cantonese. And we also have Professor Winnie Mack, professor uh, in the Department of Psychology of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And also um, and a wonderful project she's gonna tell us about. She's part of the founder of Story Taylor. Um, and it's really important that during this time of COVID that we hear from each other. Uh, we're all stuck at home uh, or working from home. Fortunately for us, Asia Society uh, reopened its door to the public about two weeks ago, and we're now also back in the office, all of us. Uh, so those of you who are really looking for an outing and just some greenery, enjoying the weather and enjoying a wonderful exhibition, Next Act, uh, Chinese uh, Hong Kong Contemporary Art, the exhibition will be on with us until March 14th. So come and... and like this online uh, to share with, with the audience. In fact, we have a quite a busy week. Uh, besides today's program, we're going to do a program on uh, women leadership uh, later on this week, as well as a program uh, co-hosting with our uh, Texas Center uh, featuring Farid Sakaria in his new book about how to cope in during a time of the pandemic. But with that, for the, with that aside, we're going to start off to the, today, this afternoon, uh, with Vivek. Uh, a chit chat between Vivek and Winnie and talking about resilience in the time of COVID. Hand it over to Winnie. Thank you. Thank you. Vivek, you want to? Hey, all right. Let's start? take the. Right. Well, I mean, look, it's a chit chat thing. We're on the screen now. They, they we're going to be talking. So for the for the next kind of an 35, 40 minutes, Winnie and myself, we're going to be talking about you know some experiences we've been through and you know the idea of resilience and you know how where where we are. I mean, let's be very honest. No one's living a perfect life. COVID is kind of weird time, right, Winnie? I mean, you've experienced some weird things in COVID, some good, some bad. But last year for both of us was kind of a little bizarre twist to it. It wasn't really so COVID related, but it was still health issue related. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. Last year, my health wasn't doing too well. And it was a time when I was like in and out hospitals, going to the wards. I'll be in there for a few days and out then go back again. And as a comedian, we, we have this kind of uh, rule that we go by comedy equals to tragedy plus time. And let me just say that was tragic for me last year. But nowadays, when I look back, I'm like, oh, that's pretty funny. That's actually funny. What about yourself, Winnie? I mean, have you been through some weird experiences that you want to share with us for in the beginning? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, when 2019, you know, right before the social movement, um, I was diagnosed with cancer. So, uh, so that was really a curveball, you know, to me. You know, everything just changes. Like uh, everything that I'm used to, all of a sudden, kind of crumble. But then, uh, it's also a great, really. Uh, like you said, it's a great timing for me to reflect on what I really want, you know, especially in light of what's going on around me, uh, the social situations and so on. So I think, yeah, I, I totally agree that um, sometimes, especially when we look back, uh, um, you know, tragedy or, or um, adversities can become you know, a blessing. Yeah. You know what's funny? I bet you all the audience now are kind of like, "What? This has this has got just got heavier than we thought." We here we were talking about resilience. These guys are talking about cancer and being inside and out of wards and everything. Whoa! Yeah, guys, don't worry, relax. Both of us, we had a little pre-meeting before this event, and we were talking. We we're having a good time and, and relax. I mean, it's it's funny because uh, now that we've gone through that experience, we can kind of look at it from a different perspective. We're not kind of in the suffering segment of it. But we've kind of gone through the experience and we're looking back and like, oh, you know what? I, I learned a lot. Like you said, cancer is bizarre because actually uh, in 2006, I was also diagnosed with lymphoma cancer, right? And it, it was weird because like back then I just thought, you know, you had cancer, you lose your hair and you die, right? But then you learn more. You're like, oh, wait, it's more than just that. It's not as, as like the movies make it seem. And the funny thing is that I was like, what, 20 something years old. I lost all my hair in my head and I got to see myself for the first time properly bald, right? And that kind of gave me a good warning. I'm like, okay, so that's what you look like bald, man. You better shampoo well. Like, you definitely want to keep all the hair you can possibly keep, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Right? What about Actually, yourself? I like, kind of the... like my bald hair. I like my, my bald really? head. Yeah, it's pretty round and, and it's pretty yeah. nice. Yeah, and then I thought, okay, if I really cannot, if my hair cannot grow back, I think I can accept this. And it's pretty cool. 
And um, yes, I'm a really a glasses person. Um, so I can kind of match that with my like really funky glasses. So yeah. that'd be cool. Yeah. I mean, it definitely makes you look way more like, you know, creative, artistic type. Like, whoa, she shaved her head off, but she's got glasses. You know what's going on over here? You know, give her a canvas or something. Yeah. I mean, what for you in the beginning when you heard about this news, was it like a real big shock? Like when I heard the news, oh, you you, you have cancer. I was like, okay, uh, so that's it. You know, it's a Thursday. Am I done by Sunday? What's what's happening over here? And it was because I did not know enough. So I just was like, oh, it's over. It's, you know, we, it was just a shock. I'm like, it's game over. I'm 27 years old. It's a great life. Whatever. Goodbye. Like, what was your initial feelings at that time? Actually, pretty calm. Um, maybe I kind of expected that given that I'm such a workaholic. There's something bound to be bad to happen to me and, you know, in terms of my health. So I'm kind of calm. And then because I'm also a researcher, so I go online and search for all the different things that I need to be prepared for and then look for like good doctors and so on. So I feel like, oh my God, for my lifetime, I learned all these skills and then for this purpose, and then now I'm really ready for it. And um, so in fact, uh, when the doctor said, actually, uh, I can, you know, schedule a a surgery next week for you. I said, wait, hold on, like, give me some more time to arrange for all these different things because I know that like in the next six months, I'll be kind of of commission so i want to take care of everything so i, I feel like i'm i'm pretty pretty calm about this whole thing yeah i yeah. think that's the thing as well initially i was kind of like frantic about it i wasn't really sure what's going on because like i only had these images of the preconceptions i had you know the cancer equals this 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 but the more i learned about it, the more i was like oh wait a second this seems to be pretty common i mean i'm not the only yeah. one okay this this seems to be a very normal thing the doctor seems super calm like yeah you have cancer i'm like aren't you surprised they're like no I said this 20 times today. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And the more I got to know it, the more I was like, oh, you know what? I think I can deal with this. And I think that's the first step, right? It's like having uh, in, in uh, strengthening yourself with a bit of knowledge, right? Yeah. If you kind of know a bit more about what's going on, then you kind of have this this drive to be like, you know what? I think I can handle this. Right. Like you were calm and you use your skills as a researcher to kind of find information. You know, for myself, I mean, obviously, you know, I wasn't a comedian back then. But I guess whenever I saw it, immediately my brain is like, hmm, what can I do with this? Now I have cancer. Can I make my friends buy me lunch? I don't know, you know. So immediately, <laughs> all these crazy ideas start coming in. So I think that's, that's like that's like a very easily step number one, right? Just basically don't just jump in and say, I don't know, it's over, it's everything. Just like get to know a bit more. Very often yeah. a problem that we have is really just something where un- it's an unknown, right? It's a new territory we've never been, so we're very scared about it. And yeah, I, think I think that's time and time your again. Body. Yeah, feel your body. Like, what's your body's telling you? There's signals going on. Yeah, and then actually, I I feel it because um because I have breast cancer, so I can actually literally feel it, and and it's kind of a signal that okay, I need to take care of myself. Of course, like mm-hmm. you said, I think I'm glad that I also have a lot of good you know social support at that time to being able to talk it out and then uh you know uh, raise my I do have some anxiety. And then, uh, you know, talk to different colleagues and, and friends about it and my fi- family. So then everything is settled and I feel like, OK, I'm ready to go for go into treatment. Yeah. 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 I think that's another thing as well for myself as well. Initially, when I first had this issue, it, it wasn't a matter of like, oh, keep it to myself and everything. But I didn't really believe that, oh, what can other people do for me? I got to go through the chemotherapy. It's relevant to you guys. Uh, but then, you know, then my, my, my family told me, hey, why don't you go to this, some of these uh, peer support groups? You know, have a little talk to people, you know, so everyone over there is going through the same thing. They may relate better. I'm like, oh, what's the point? You know, talk to them and what we all sulk together. But, you know, talking to people, getting it out of your system and also realizing that, hey, wait a second, you know what? Maybe I don't have it as bad as I thought it was, you know, or maybe you've been through something similar and you you're, you look fine. So I can have something to look forward to. And I think that's one thing that we're lacking a lot, especially with COVID times. We're not sharing a lot of things we're going through, right? A lot of times we forget the story part of our lives. We're just so busy doing like you were a workaholic. I'm a workaholic in many ways. And we forget that. Wait, what am I doing? What what did I do? If I have to recount, what, what do I tell people? Right? Storytelling is important. I feel that in, yeah. in our own health, well-being as well. Yes, I think so. I, I totally agree that storytelling is very important and oftentimes being ignored. Or in fact, people may think, well, why should I share my stories? Like, uh, will people look you know, strangely at me and uh, maybe make fun of me or even stigmatize me if they know that I have certain you know, issues and problems? So I think, uh, uh, um, you know, Hong Kongers are not really used to telling stories and also listening to stories. Like, you know, on the back of me there, I have the Chinese character uh, about listening. Oh, Tang, I think it's yeah. It's so important, yeah. It's so important to be, it's reciprocal and it's mutual. It's not just someone telling, but then also someone needs to receive it and listen. So yeah, I, I think that's very important. 
Yeah, I mean, and let me tell you this: as a comedian, man, it is painful when you're you're telling someone a story and no one's listening. You're like, oh, guys, do you not enjoy this joke, right? It it it's a tough kind of stuff. But like you said, I mean, I, I I really also do agree that the idea is that very often, especially in Hong Kong, like you said, the culture is not the type of like, oh, let me tell you how my day was. Everyone's like, why? It's irrelevant to me. You're not going to make me rich by telling me how your day was. So why am I here listening to you for free? Right, mm -hmm. but what I find is that we often forget that when you hear each other's stories, it kind of in its own indirect way may motivate you. For example, if someone does something really well, you're kind of like, you know, I want to do that too. It's like seeing your friend who, let's say, had this goal of, let's say, gaining some muscle, and you see them more muscular. You're like, you know what, I I want to do that too. You know, you can do it, I can do it. Kind of motivation. At the same time, you know, hearing a story kind of makes your life in perspective, where you kind of go like, oh, you know what, wow, okay, my day wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Now, you know, when I hear your day, I'm like, wow, I should not be complaining. I should be yeah. pretty grateful for what I have, right? Yeah, and it's not even even like has to. It doesn't have to be even aspirational or motivational. I think it's just the fact that everybody is unique. You know, everybody has their own story. It's like like in this whole wide world, we only have one Winnie Mac and buyback, right? So so yeah. I think we're totally unique. So any story that we tell is, is is special. And I want to make sure that people understand that. It's not just like, oh, I need to be really motivational in order to tell a story. It doesn't necessarily to be the case. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the funny thing is, you know, a lot of people come up to me, oh, you know, how do you start as being comedian? You know, how do you write your funny stories and everything? And I tell people the truth is, very rarely do I sit down and say, okay, now I'm going to write something funny. Okay, funny. Okay, what's funny? You know, I'm not doing that. But very often what I find is that just general daily life, we yeah. do a lot of things that may not seem funny to you because you did it, but when you retell it, it's more entertaining to the other person because it's so new, it's so fresh, right? I mean, like even during COVID, we were talking earlier on the idea of like COVID, the, the gathering limit, you can't, you know, hang out with large groups and everything. And I was joking the other day, I said, this is really bizarre where right. people who are, you know, these social, you know, exiles, nobody wanted to be the friends were like, you know what? This is perfectly fine for me. I am a okay with this. Two people, four people makes no difference to me, right? Other people are freaking out. Oh my god, I have all my friends. What do I do, right? It's, it's a bizarre twist where now all of a sudden the introverts are winning. Yeah, yeah. This is my game. <laughs> yeah. So and and it's so funny, like you said about the daily things that seemingly stupid or not even you know trivial. It can be very funny. Just just last week, I um you know the theater is like reopened, right? So I I watched a movie with some friends. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll book the tickets. So it's just been so long that I haven't booked a ticket, and I booked the first row. And I thought I was so smart to book like the last row, so then we can all you know. And then and then my friend that actually you booked the first row, you know that I was like, oh shit, like oh, I'm it's reverse. Uh, yeah, it's reversed. So it's been so long. So and 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 it becomes like our, our story, you know, our our our, our a funny story. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I mean, it might even end up being an, a yearly tradition. All right, which movie are you watching the first year this first right. row this year? You know, it becomes a thing. Like you're watching everything. All you can see are the subtitles. Like wow, the subtitles are really big from the front row. This is crazy, right? I mean, I tell people, I, I was I was joking about the other day to my friend. I was like, you know, the uh, cinemas. I believe it's alternate rows, right? Yeah. You have one row. And I, I was finding it funny because I'm like, let me, let me try to understand this. So you're saying the virus can only go sideways. It can't go forward and back. Like it can't do north and south. Like it can do east and west. I'm like, I'm, I'm a bit confused. How did, how did you calculate? It was just, you got a feng shui master. He's like, yes, this direction is good, good energy, right? And I was just thinking about the whole thing. I'm like, it's actually weird because like a lot, if you took uh, three years ago and told us what we're doing now, We'd all look at you funny like this. This guy's an idiot. I don't know what you're talking about for a face mask. Oh my god! What is? It? And three years later, all of a sudden, hey, we're all doing it. You know, it's all no. If anything, three years ago, if you wore a face mask, people look at you going like, "What's wrong with you? You have no immune system. What's wrong with you?" Right? Today, you don't wear a face mask. You're like, "Oh my god! What's wrong with you? Oh my god! What's wrong with you? Where? Put your put your mask back on, right?" And it's such a bizarre twist where a lot of things are put on perspective, and it doesn't mean that what is right today is right tomorrow, but also doesn't mean what is wrong today is wrong tomorrow. And a lot of times I tell people, even like my comedy, it's not that, you know, I live a funnier life. It's like I just kind of look at my life and try to play with it, you know, instead of just judging and saying, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is A, this is B. I'm like, hmm, why do I do A, right? I Recently, I was, I was, I was talking to the, the friend, and I said, you know what's, what's bizarre? It really is weird how excited we get when we're waiting at a bus stop for a bus. It's like we're waiting for an idol to appear. 
you know, like I say, you, you're waiting for the number 23 and you're like, oh my God, the 23 is almost here. I'm so excited. The bus is almost going to arrive. You know, the bus arrives. You're like, oh, the bus is here. Take my money. You know, it's, it's weird. We're taking a bus, but we're treating it like, you know, some rock star. And it was just like a different perspective. I mean, a bus could be a very boring experience, but it's really how you look at it, like a little playfulness. And suddenly it makes life so, so much more uh, interesting as well. Like you said, going to the cinema, you could have now kind of argued with your friend and said, oh, you're an idiot, you bought the worst row ever. But you looked at it and like, you know what, that, that might be something so different. We never actually sat in the front row. And if anything, we saw this movie so differently from everyone else. You know, we're going to see all the details everybody missed out. Like anyway, I, I, I want to ask you a question. So how how do you like how do you notice all these fine details and and kind of uh, make a twist out of it or or have take a different the power of, of boredom. That's right, people. <laughs> no, actually, I think what happens for me is that I'm. I, I, I'm, I'm a bit curious, so I'm always like wondering, huh, why is this? Why is this? You know, like, you know, like the young kid who keeps asking why. I kind of yeah. kept that habit of like, why do we do that? But also at the same time, I feel that uh, very often we miss out on things because we automatically conclude that this is the end of it, mm -hmm. right? So in comedy, what we're really doing is we're not putting an end to the situation. We're kind of like trying to describe a bit more. But also, if you force me to like, let's say, like, okay, let me give you an example. Remember in school when you have, let's say, those big essays we have to do, let's say, 10-page essays, right? Now, clearly, no topic is that interesting that you can write 10 pages. So you're writing one page of good information and nine of just rubbish, right? We're just like, oh, this is good. using all the big grammatical words. This is therefore we are going to perhaps think about, you know, which is useless words. But in comedy, what you're trying to do is like, how can I describe such a mundane situation in such an interesting way that it makes it so different? So I have to compare. You know, I'm looking at the bus. I'm like, what is this feeling like? How do I feel right now? I'm at the bus stop. I'm excited. When else am I excited like this? Oh, you know what? Maybe when I'm waiting for uh, the line at a store, when I'm the next person. Maybe when I'm waiting for like a doctor, when I'm waiting to see the doctor, I'm the next guy. You know, that feeling of being next, right? And I was like, you know, it's interesting. I'm feeling the same feeling I would as excited as being the next guy at a restaurant who's waiting for the number to be called, right? And I was like, oh, that's a bizarre thing. And I try to basically compare. How is this the same? And it's such a weird twist because like, you don't think of taking a bus as exciting as chasing an idol on the street. So that's how I kind of form my ideas and kind of compare and contrast and play with it. So it makes taking the bus more fun. You know, I take the bus all the time. You know, after, after 30 something years of the bus, you're like, this is, this is boring. I need something more. And you kind of play with it. That's, that's where the ideas try to come out. That reminds me of, because um, I, I practice mindfulness, that reminds me of like having a beginner's mind, like you always are curious and then, you know, uh, and, and nothing is boring. I mean, nothing is, is, everything is just the first time you actually interact, like even though you have taken bus for like 30 years, but this particular, you know, experience is unique. And I, yeah. I really appreciate that. You know, that's really, uh, that's really way, a good way I think, to I look think at things. Yeah, what you said is exactly it. I, I like you know when we talk about resilience and stuff like that. A lot of times we we kind of give up on ourselves because we kind of look at our own previous history and kind of like, oh, I can't do that. I've never been able to do it. But if you take the beginner's mind, and I, I do believe in that, where you look at something from a fresh perspective every single time, then it's like you, you just restart every single day. I couldn't do it yesterday, but doesn't mean I can't do it today. Yeah. Right, give it a shot. And maybe if you can't do it yesterday, then maybe today adjust a little bit. I mean, there, Einstein did say, right, insanity is the idea of having a different outcome from the same in, input, right? So if you do the same thing over and over again, obviously the outcome is going to be the same. But if every day you kind of like say, mm, maybe if I try this, what if I do that? What if I do that? And all of a sudden mm -hmm. it changes the, the whole perspective. It's, it's the same with like cancer. I mean, uh, when I had my chemotherapy, it was basically six sessions of injections every three weeks. And the flow was you get the injection and on that day you throw everything up, right? Yeah. You just can't eat your food. And for the next 10 days you get worse. Then you start getting better after 10 days. And on the and 21st you day you get the injection again, right? So right. you know yeah. the deal. So yeah. I tell people, I was like, you know what? This is, this is fantastic because on the day of my injection, I go usually like let's say around noon or something. That morning, I can eat the worst breakfast ever. I can eat all that junk food, all that rubbish because I know I'm not going to digest it. It's coming back out. Right, so I can eat all the terrible stuff. I'm gonna have you know hot cakes and pancakes and everything. And I go to the hospital. I'm like, all right, I had a big meal. Let's clear that calories. I don't want those calories. You know, I can joke about it that way. In the same way, uh, it's also it was a really good mental training. Uh -huh. Every single time I take the injection, as much as I know what to expect, yeah. every single time, you never know, right? This might be a bit different. So that's another. Right. I think that's another thing. Like, the beginner's mind really helps a lot, and it keeps things fresh. It keeps it fun every single day. 
Yeah, especially when I have my chemo, is 50% of what you have, like, because I have eight injections every two weeks. So it's sort of like a turbo version of your yeah. chemo. And um, so, yeah, it's totally that, that, okay, I feel a little bit better now. Okay, tomorrow I have to go back to, to get the injection. But yeah. each time, like, and, and I become so in tune with my body because like the, like the aches, like the pains, like even my neck, I cannot really like lift it up. It's just so painful, right? And then I, I just noticed that because uh, uh, and then, like because I have nothing else to do because like I, I feel so painful that I need to lay down. So why not just notice all this pain and what does that feel like? And after a while, I realized that I don't I'm not in pain all the time. Like like sometimes I can really lift up my neck and without feeling painful. So so it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, like all of a sudden, like the times kind of stop and then I can just notice more of how how my body is responding and telling me uh, what's going on. And like when my whole mouth is like with all the sores and I cannot taste anything, like there's no taste, like uh, all of a sudden I can start eating a lot of spicy food and then <laughs> like act like I, OK, I can eat like 10 spicy food, right? Like 10, 10 spices or that. that yeah. Uh, that, yeah, the level 10. And one. Then yeah, I don't yeah. feel anything. <laughs> So, um, so it's quite uh, a, a different experience. I'm telling you, I mean, like, if 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 you let me redo this whole chemotherapy thing again, like, you know, nowadays, there's so much I could play with. Like, for example, uh, number one, I could joke about how doing a little time lapse video or photos every single day of me not cutting my hair but losing my hair, and people are like, wow, I want to see what you look like tomorrow. It'll be a great social media kind of campaign. And another thing, like I said, if I could, if I had no taste in my mouth, do you know how how big a viral video that could have been? If you filmed yourself eating level 10 chili, like no big deal, people are like, how is she doing that? You're like, hey, hey, I don't reveal my secrets, okay? Subscribe to my channel. Maybe I'll tell you one day. You know, there's so many things you can play with. And I think really that's what it is. I just says in tune with your body. And you know, like today, nowadays, people always talk about mindfulness and, you know, knowing, being in the now. And that in its own weird way was kind of very forced mindfulness on you. Because it's not that you wanted to be in tune, but you couldn't do anything. So you had no choice but to be in tune, right? You had... The pain was so severe that you had nothing but to notice it. But mm -hmm. over time, you know what to expect, right? You kind of know like, okay, I, I know. Today's day three. I know this is going to happen. I'm ready for it. Which also kind of gives you this weird moment of excitement where you look forward to, let's say, day seven. When you're like, oh, I'm going to feel better by, by tomorrow. I can't wait. I'm, I've got my whole day planned out. I'm ready to go. And it's kind of a weird thing. I tell people as well that it's that experience that has taught me that no matter how bad it is today, there's going to be like you know light at the end of the tunnel that you can look forward to, and instead of just waiting for that tunnel uh, the light to show up, kind of be ready for it. You know, when the opportunity shows up, you're ready to strike. Like in my comedy, I can't sit and say, "Okay, come on, where's the comedy? Where's the comedy?" I have to be so ready with a notebook, with a pen, with my phone, whatever. That if I notice something, bam, I get it written down. You know, it's not the other way where it's like wait for the opportunity, but it's more like you know any moment now I have to be ready to capture these moments. And I think that definitely was a lesson that you learned as well, right, through the whole right. experience. And that reminds me, like nowadays, people have to quarantine for 21 days, like, and they may think, oh, that's very boring. And, and maybe what we have talked about may, may help people, like to start noticing small stuff and how, how different is your, your bed compared to yesterday or even a minute ago. So, yeah. 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 It, it, I tell you, like quarantines and COVID and everything has really made you rethink. For example, I, I used to joke about how uh, when we were stuck at home and the gyms were closed and parks were closed and everything, everyone's trying to get creative, right? Working out from home. Mm -hmm. right? And it's bizarre here in Hong Kong. I mean, people thinking, you know, oh, you, you go online, people say, oh, you know, you can run around your house, you know, run around the bed. I'm like, do you understand? Even if we did 100 laps in an apartment in Hong Kong, that's basically two meters we ran. That's all we ran. Okay. It's so small. So the other thing is you start trying to lift weights and I'm just like, wow, that's a really good challenge because think about it. A lot of times we have small furniture, your table's kind of light. You're trying to lift your table like this is too light for me. I, any, everything I own is too light, right? And you try to get creative. Okay, water bottles. Can I get a bigger water bottle? Yeah. Can, I, can I get a heavier one? And I bet you one day it's going to become a new trend when you go to the gym. You don't ask people, oh, how many kilos do you like? To, do you weight lift? You know, you just say, how many liters do you weight lift? How many bottles do you weight lift? You know, all these kind of weird twists that we had to get creative with because, mm -hmm. you know, we were put in the circumstances. And so the funny thing is that all along you could have worked out at home. You just never did. But now yeah. that you were forced upon it, boom, all of a sudden your house is the gym already, right? You can do so right. many things with it. Yeah, I think so. I think there's going to be so many different new normals you know, after this COVID and, and um, our whole lives will kind of, you know, some, some things that we thought that is necessity all of a sudden becomes like, maybe I don't really need it. 
or, or, or there's something, you know, a different uh, uh, perspective yeah. on things. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. I tell people, like, now when I see my friends in, in person, I look at them I'm like, yeah, you're overexposed. Turn down your web camera. Oh, you're, this is your real face? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so confused. I, I'm so used to the, the web camera and everything. And it's, it's like, that's another thing, right? We've gotten so used to, let's say, talking to cameras, you know, from our own room. And you would have never imagined. You'd be like, I would never be a news reporter. I would never be on TV. But you know what? We're all on TV now. We're all, you know, actors. We're all film stars now. So it's a weird twist, right? All of a sudden, yeah. you got these older generations getting used to the computer. Everyone's installing Instagram. I'm like, even my mom's on Instagram. I'm like, why? Like, what have you done? I can't believe it, you know? So these kind of things kind of give you opportunities. And it's really how you play with it. So again, coming back to the whole idea of resilience and everything, it's a, it's, I always feel that no matter what you go through today, that's a story you could tell someone one day. And you may feel that that story is useless. It's irrelevant. No one really cares. But the truth is there is someone who's, you know, maybe bizarre enough or crazy enough that they just find your story fascinating. It's yeah. like I talk to people about comedy and there are some people who are like, I really want to know how does a comedy get through? His, I mean, how does a comedian get through their day? And I'm like, oh. like anyone, I go to the toilet or brush my teeth. What do you think is going to happen? I slip in the toilet. I have banana peels on the floor. It doesn't work that way. You know, and they're like, wow, it's fascinating. I never thought of that. And I really feel like the idea of storytelling is something that we've underrepresented and undervalued very often. Because at the end of the day, let's be honest, you know, when we all finish work, we're all tired, we all meet our friends and everything. What do we do? We talk about our stories. We talk about the silly, crazy things that we went through when we were maybe younger together, right? Yeah, I think storytelling is more about telling us as you know, our humanity and to, to let more people know like how, how everybody is, you know, living in their lives and so on. And speaking of resilience, I want to clarify on one point that I, we, I, I don't mean to say that we need to be resilient when we're taking a lot of uh, nonsense or oppression or so on. But I think uh, it's important that we will be able to bounce back in adversity, but it doesn't mean that we have to take it all in when, when, and just suck it up when, when things are not, you know, making sense and, and the structure are not, you know, uh, facilitating us. So it's sort of like, I think we need to pay more attention, like speaking of mindfulness, I think we need also to pay attention to our environment, you know, what's going on around us, you know, our relationships and so on, because those are all nutrients that really, you know, you know, feels us and, and become, you know, co cultivate who we are. And just like kind of like a flowers, like they need sunlight, moisture and soil and so on. Just like uh, for us, we also need that suitable environment. So I just want to clarify that it doesn't mean that, oh, we just need to suck it up and then be resilient when we're really, you know, taking in a lot of shit, so on. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, okay. I tell you what, we like in in a, in a few minutes we're going to open up to the Q&A. I see there's a whole bunch okay. of questions in on Slido as well. But before we go into Q&A, uh when you think about it as well, uh, I I usually tell people like one little tip I share with a lot of people coming from my side as a comedian, like things I can do to kind of get through every day no matter how bad the day is, mm -hmm. is two things, right? Number one is the the act of gratitude. Like this this is a very common thing where every single day you kind of wake up and you look back to yesterday and you find two things you're grateful for. It's a very simple exercise, but it kind of makes you realize that every single day, no matter how bad your day is today, yeah. tomorrow when you wake up, you look back and still be able to find two things you kind of go like, you know what, it was still a good day. It wasn't 100% bad, right? That's number one. And number two is that as a simple technique for my comedy writing as well, is that every single day, just look out in the world and force yourself to find one interesting thing. Just one thing you find interesting today, write it down. It doesn't have to be a story. It doesn't have to be funny. Just, just interesting. Okay. So, for example, uh, the other day I wrote down something interesting. You know, whether it becomes a comedy routine, who knows? But the idea was like, you know, and when we take the buses here in Hong Kong, we have those priority seats, right? Mm -hmm. Where you know the elderly, the pregnant can get to sit there. And you know, it's understandable. It's very reasonable. Uh, the funny thing though is that usually everyone else, other than the elderly, pregnant, stuff like that, would everyone avoids those seats. They're like, no, no, I'm not sitting there. No, no way. I, I want to be anywhere. Right? But reverse, it's very unfair because the elderly, the pregnant, and stuff can choose not to sit on the priority seats and sit on the normal seats. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't get it both ways, all right? You get your four priority seats on per bus, that's yours. Every other seat is ours. You don't get to be old and sit on my seat, okay? I don't sit on yours, you don't sit on mine. You know? So I wrote that down, it's very interesting. I'm like, oh, it's very interesting how, you know, it doesn't work the other way. How come they can sit on our seats but I can sit on their seats, you know? So I write that down and I just put it aside. And maybe a, a while later, I look back at it. Can I kind of twist and turn it? Can I make a funny angle about it? And that makes every single day like a game. There's a thing called gamification where you turn everything into a game. And this is a game for myself. Can I find one interesting thing per day? 
that will hopefully become comedy. And that's something I, I tell people to do. What about yourself, Winnie? Any kind of little tips or tricks that you do uh, to help yourself get, you know, enjoy every single day? Well, uh, meditate daily. So, and I think that helps um, by, you know, focusing on my breath and then my, my thoughts, like just let it, and then noticing that, oh, did drift and then um, coming back again. Um, I think that's really helped me to, to be more anchor and, uh, and grounded. Um, mm. And then the second thing is um, I, I, I recently, I tried to remind myself that uh, we are all interrelated. Um, it makes me less selfish and um, maybe more considerate um, mm. and, uh, cause, and, and that's very important, I think, nowadays. So uh, I've been trying to remind myself that, uh, just be my, my, more mindful of what's going on around me, inside of me, and also reminding myself, like, we're interrelated, we're all in together. Um, yeah. So, yeah. True. I mean, like, let's be honest, usually they always say the six degrees of separation where, you know, every mm -hmm. six person knows each other so i'm like yeah you know if there's six people in the room someone knows my parents so i'm gonna be nice to them now all right we'll see from there but hey we've been talking for a good like half an hour already and i think you know i see a whole bunch of questions coming in on slido and i already see someone has specifically pointed out one question to me they said uh to vivek is it important to you that your set or act imparts a deeper meaning to your audience uh Generally, very rarely do I write comedy saying, okay, how can I change the world with this? But usually I find it's a very often a byproduct of what I do. So very often I might be joking about something, but it kind of invokes a deeper thinking process when you hear it, right? So for example, uh, a lot of my comedy when I first started doing stand-up was a lot about my identity and how I can fit in and the, oh. the uh, uh, racial issues I was dealing with. And it was purely for fun, just joking about how people stopped me on the streets, check my ID card, stuff like that. But over time, it made people go like, yeah, that is an issue, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, why is it that, you know, the South Asian kid amongst his Chinese classmates and friends, why is right. it that the police only seem to stop him? You know, well, this is actually an issue. We should deal with it. And it, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, OK, I guess I've just invoked a new discussion, I guess, you know. But very rarely do I write comedy saying, OK, you know what? I'm going to make you laugh, but I'm going to change the world with it. Very, very rarely do I go that that wise and that grand in my, in my work. I think it's so important to be able to see, uh, you know, to to hear diverse voices like your experience as a, you know, uh, as a um, South Asians in Hong Kong. And then um, and then for me, you know, having a lived experience of so social anxiety and depression is also valuable. You know, so people will see me like, oh, I'm just a professor. You no, know, I know a lot of stuff and I'm an academic. But uh, I also want people to know that like that life experience actually changed my lives. Otherwise, I would not be so committed in you know fighting for stigma, doing research on mental health. So, so um, I think all these stories need to be told, and then to have people reflect on that. What does that mean to me? And uh, what does it mean, you know, uh, for an ethnic minority to be living in Hong Kong? You know, I, I think yeah. oftentimes um, all these voices are being ignored and and even turned invisible. So I think that's very important. Yeah, you know, you I think that's your, the thing. Yeah, your stage yeah, you hit it just right. That. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very lucky. I do have a platform in that sense. Yeah. It's like a stage to speak my mind. So uh, in that sense, I'm very lucky, but also I have to be, you know, great power comes great responsibility. So, you know, not to actually take the stage and abuse it and kind of mock it about, oh, you're an idiot, huh? you can't speak English, you know, none of that. But it's more like just, hey, let's all laugh about life and maybe kind of invoke some thought in your head. Uh -huh. where you are like, oh, you know, that, that actually impacted me more than I thought it would. Let me have a think about that. Yeah, as you said. Yeah. I mean, Winnie, I can see a whole bunch of questions as well coming on the Slido that they even... Uh, asking some of some to you as well to so okay. see if you have any questions that you, you feel like you're up for okay well there's one question about why is it important to you know share our mental health journeys um and um and could you share how storyteller works to promote that okay uh let me tell you uh, okay so we set up storyteller uh in 2015 uh first of all I'll start off with a uh, uh together with my uh former student, Amanda Lee, now a clinical psychologist. And at that time, we just want to have a platform for people to, you know, to share stories about their mental health experience. Because uh, we don't, even though we may be considered professionals, uh, but we don't want to be uh, um, single out only professionals have a voice to say about mental health. We also, this is a special, everything, um, no, people, uh, mental health experience are so unique for everybody. So I want to have that experience and then to have that platform. And so since then, uh, we invite people to share their stories uh, on our platform uh, through social media. We also have people to do it face to face. And, um, and then uh, we want to cultivate that environment where people can listen to people's stories like, you know, that, that uh, calligraphy. 
and also at the same time to to be able to share their unique stories that oftentimes they some people may feel that oh it's a shame to share or stigmatizing to share but then um, no I, I i we want to value that uh lived experience is part of humanity is part of your life and then we should be able to talk about it and even when we talk about our, our mental health journeys, it's not solely about our, our mental illness or our, our symptoms. It's about how we you know, live with it, how we navigate it. And it's also about how, how we shape our values and then our, our personality. So it's about the whole person. It's not just about mental health or mental illness. So I think that's important. So then people can three, see a three-dimensional you know, or, or a, a four-dimensional person as you know, as a whole person, instead of just that that label of having a mental disorder, so I think that's yeah. very important. Yeah, I think that that's basically. I mean, very often, like I said, we just jump to the conclusion: oh, you have this issue, you're equal to this. You know, like I said, you can jump. Like someone has a mental issue, and you're like, oh, mental issue. That means you have a problem. Okay, you stay away from me. It's like, wait, hold on a second. There's there's way more than you think. It's kind of like saying, if, if I have cancer, people are like, oh, stay away from me. Hey, don't spread it to me. I'm like, I I can't give it to you. It it doesn't work that way. Okay. I don't, I don't come up to you, but like, hey, here's, hey, take some cancer. It doesn't work that way. And I think the more we know about it, the more we're willing to share, the more we realize, wait a second, you know what? Maybe I'm not the only one, or maybe I didn't realize I have this issue, mm -hmm. right? And then you might have just bottled it down, thinking, no, no, it's fine. I'm okay. Nobody around me has it, so I'm the odd one out. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll suck it up and stuff. So I think what we often find is that on the surface, we see someone like you said, you're a professor, I'm a comedian, and people think, oh, you know, they're, they're pretty, pretty set. You know, she's doing well, he's doing well. But actually, behind the scenes, we have issues that we have to deal with on a daily basis. It's just a matter of, are we able to deal with it? Uh, does it does it, does it it take control of us? Or even if it does take control, how do we deal with that? You know, how do we kind of stay in control uh, even when times you, you feel like you can lose in control? And I find like a lot of the questions on Slido as well is, is asking about, you know, how does the mental health issue or the well-being issue affect your work? Like someone was asking, how does it has how has mental health played a role in your stand-up comedy? And someone also asked, in view of COVID-19, how have you managed and changed your approach to sharing comedy, humor, and support with the community? And I find this is a really interesting time. So during COVID, initially, you know, comedy shows were all stopped. There were not, no live shows and everything. You know, so you kind of waited out. Okay, you know what? I'll just write some comedy at home and wait it out, right? And after a few weeks, you're like, hey, man, you know, like, when is this going to open up again? You know, I need to, I have all these ideas I want to try out on stage. Because in comedy, it's a very uh, in work in progress process where I can't just write a whole show and go to stage and be like, that's the show. It's like I have to write some stuff, go to an open mic night, try it out, you know, get the audience feedback, go back and adjust it and stuff until I kind of feel, okay, this is pretty, pretty solid. This is pretty refined and then make it a proper show. So without that middle process, I'm lost. I'm like, what do I do now? You know, and the lack of practice. Then I'm thinking, okay, so can I do virtual shows? Now, it's one thing doing shows face-to-face. -face, it's another thing doing online because let's be very honest. If you're doing a show virtually, the audience is sitting in their own rooms watching you on a screen. It's two-dimensional. They're in their own homes. Maybe the kids are on the right laughing and playing around. Maybe the someone is messaging you at the same time. So you're kind of distracted. So how can you as a performer kind of give them the same experience they would in person? as compared to online, right? So then you have to think about these things. Okay, I, they, they lose the face-to-face -face value, but can I add something else about it? So for example, when I do, let's say, virtual comedy events, right? Let's say, let's say this is a virtual comedy show and you're one of the audience. Now, the unique thing about this is that you're coming to me from your room with your camera on. So I actually can not only just see you at, like I would at a comedy show, I get to see you and your background. So now I can kind of make fun of it where I'm like, oh, look at you with a little plant near, the, near the, uh, the, the window, right? Making sure you get some fresh air, but you also have an empty black seat kind of telling me you have no friends. I'm like, okay, you know what? Here's a chair just in case someone decides to come and say hi. I want to make sure you get to sit down. You're not going anywhere, right? And you've got your books in the background, which I'm sure you've organized in a certain way. I've read this. I've not read that. I'm going to read that you know things like that and you can kind of joke about that and mm -hmm. people finally feel like wow I've, I've never had someone else kind of joke about my environment so that was very unique online so I could play with that right. secondly because of technology not only can I let's say do shows like this uh, in comedy shows let's say uh, the audience is heckling me right They're like boo you're not funny right now at a comedy show live face to face I, I have to handle that I can kind of you know talk back to them or ignore them but the good thing was online events, let's say you were a bad audience member, you were heckling me, boo, you're terrible, right? You know what I can do? Mute you. Done. I'm like, this is the best. This is fantastic. And you know what? Worst case scenario, you might say, yeah, but you know, you lose the laughter and everything. Hey, never ever underestimate the power of canned laughter, right?
So now anything I say is hilarious because I'm like, they laughed, they laughed. Everyone's loving this show, right? So again, it's all about how you play with it. So as someone asked on, on Slido, that, you know, how have you managed to change your approach? I kind of always felt that for every one element of the live show, I cannot do in person face to face. I have to replace it with a different element virtually to replace that experience. So if you cannot see me and feel the room of people laughing, now instead I can kind of add random effects, right? All of a sudden I can do, let's say, a comedy show and I'm saying, so the other day I was walking down the street and... What? Right? So all of a sudden now you're like, oh, there's another another kind of entertaining element that I can kind of replace it with. So I think that's one thing I, can, I always say, evolution. You know, COVID's kind of forced us to all evolve in our own way. Right, where we used to be like, no, I'm fine. It works. Don't, 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 don't change anything. But now you're like, I have to change something. I have to do something about it. And I think that's a, that's a resilience. That's life as well, right? It's a matter of ability to evolve and change with the times, right. rather than to say, but that's always been the way. Why is this not working anymore? You know, I mean, like I said, you could still stick to writing letters by hand, but in the world of email, your business is not going to really survive if you're writing people letters by hand. Okay, yeah. you, you have to go with the times. Yeah, change is norm actually. Yeah, it's normative to change, and everything's ever changing. In fact. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see any other questions. Let's see what's going okay. on over here. Okay. All right, people, come on in. So, if you have any questions, Slido, uh, drop us a message. We'll try our best to kind of quickly look through it. Um, I see a lot of people. I I love the fact that everyone today on Slido is anonymous. Yes, that's the best. It seems either we have someone who's really called anonymous, and they're a big fan of this talk. Or everyone is like, yeah, uh, my, fa my, my name very special, not going to tell you. I'm like, that's cool. It's fine. I don't really need to tell you your name. I just need to know your question, right? Let's take a look. You have anything uh, you want to ask? Otherwise, I seem a, lo a lot of people seem to be asking about my comedy life. Anything mm -hmm. you want to go with Winnie first? Uh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'm going to summarize. I see a lot of people are asking about my comedy. First. So uh, first of all, what made me want to do comedy was that when I was growing up, I used to watch a lot of sitcoms. And uh, one of them was a show called Seinfeld. And it's this guy called Jerry Seinfeld, right? And so in the beginning of every episode, he would come up and do some stand-up comedy. Now, I did not know what that was. I just thought it was part of the show. But I was like, this is very fascinating. This guy just comes up onto the stage, just you know, looks at an audience, holds a mic, and just talks. And I'm like, I could do that. I have stupid things I could say as well. And then I learned, oh, that's what stand-up comedy is. So I think probably end of secondary school or beginning of university, I, I promised myself that one day before I die, I'm going to try stand-up comedy. Now, I did not know where or when. There was no real opportunity. It's not like I was a big star. I could book like a big stadium or anything. So I thought, you know, just, just an idea. One day, I, I'll try. So ever since I made that promise, I kind of had this habit of writing down ideas just in case that, that opportunity came. And eventually in 2007, I got the opportunity to perform uh, in a comedy competition. You know, I said, hey, just give it a shot, see what happens. I went on stage. It was more than I expected. I was like, wow, this is better than I thought. I thought it would just be me talking, people laughing. I was like, this is a, this is a completely different game. This is fantastic. You know, these people are, I, I love the energy. And ever since then, I just kept it as a hobby. Hobby, hobby, slowly built. You know, every single day, I kind of feel, how can I do more? How can I do more? I, I don't just want to do it as a part-time fun thing. I'm like, what else can I do? What more can I do? And over time, it grew. Every opportunity I got, you know, if a, if a bar had a show, I'm like, hey, can I do a five-minute spot up there? You know, I might contact different organizations. Hey, you have an event. You want some comedy? I'll come and do it for free. And just re building my skill set and also my name and also experience. And over time became a full-time job and nowadays I mean it's funny because people talk about you know mental well-being where you have to go you know maybe share your uh, go see a psychiatrist a shrink whatever and here I am charging people to hear me vent about my life I'm like this is a great business model I could do this every single day so that's how it all began with my comedy and it was really just a matter of me coping it was a coping mechanism I used to use comedy to cope with like all the the, the painful times like you know people make fun of me in school you know mocking my my, my skin color or body hair or whatever and I would just like hey it's, it's a body hair's pretty good here you want some hair here take some hair you know I would kind of joke about it but it became my coping mechanism that I figured hey you know what I enjoy this coping mechanism it helps me deal with life in the way that I kind of feel more comfortable with so even with cancer or whatever you know after a while I would just joke about it and that's how the whole whole flow happened it was just a coping mechanism to an interest to a hobby into what more can I do and boom after so many years this is what I do yeah that relates right. to there's some questions about like what what to do when you're down or when when you're not well and so on and uh, maybe I can share a little bit of my experience uh, well, I have had, uh, you know, like I said earlier, I have social anxiety and persistent depression for like over 10 years uh, since high school. And uh, at that time, it really feel like 
a, a living hell. You know, I, I, I avoid, you know, talking to friends or literally I don't have any friends actually. And, um, and I actually script every single telephone conversation because I'm afraid that people will mess it up, you know? And so now I'm, you know, in a, in a, you know, stand up with, you know, buyback, you know, and then this is totally anxious actually. Um, but I want to say that, uh, for me, I think to acknowledge that I'm not well, I think thinking back um, to know that like, this is okay, I'm not feeling well, and I feel different from other people. Um, and, and at that time, I do sometimes don't uh, feel that I don't see the end of the tunnel. But then um, I also at the same time tell myself that there is hope. I mean, I, um, things will turn around and um, I think uh, I will find my way. And at that point, because I don't have any friends, so what do I do? I only study. So I'm kind of really a, a big nerd at that time. And I think as, as it turns out, because I'm such a nerd, I become a professor, you know? <laughs> and so I can, you know, study all I want, I can read all I want, and I, I and feel okay about it. So I think it's more about like finding your strength, finding what's what really works for you. And, um, and then doesn't have to be uh, fit with the status quo. And, um, and oftentimes, in fact, uh, for the past, you know, 30, 40 years, I always felt out of place. And I, I start to embrace that. That's me. And then I don't need to fit in, I don't need to, you know, meet the status quo. And but at the time when I was young, I feel really bad about that because I cannot, you know, I, I'm not like other people, my peers, and I feel really strange about it. And so I think it's important to have that courage to to embrace who I am and, and to understand what I really need. And because um, I was reading uh, some questions on Slido, what can you do? I think oftentimes is you need to tell, ask yourself, like, what are some of the things that really help me? So when earlier we talked about how we pay attention to very small details in, in life, I think it's important to do that, to recognize what makes, what cheer me up and what really makes me down and um, recognize that and do more of what cheer you up and do less of what, you know, makes you down. And uh, gradually you, you find a way to, to take care of yourself. And um, uh, there's really no formula, everybody's different. So I hope everybody can find their own way and embrace yourself. Yeah. I think, I think that's another thing is like when you're young, you're trying to fit in and everything. And the weird thing is that when you had a hard time growing up and not fitting in, it actually forces you to get to know yourself because you're mm -hmm. your best friend, right? You're the only one who's accepting yourself exactly. and you get to know yourself, right? And it's a weird thing where, yeah, it's really tough. It's really painful at the time. But the same for myself is that I'm, I know myself enough where let's say uh, something happened and you're like, oh, Viv, I, I, Viv, you did that. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure I would never, that's not me. I'm very confident. I would, no matter what situation it is, I would never do that. You know, and I would be confident it won't happen to me. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure I would not be like that type of person to do that, right? At the same time, the better you know yourself, the better you're able to know what you seem to like and not like. And therefore, you're not just trying and hoping, oh, he likes that, so I'm going to try that as well. We're, like, I'm way past that. So, for example, it's a bizarre thing where uh, people have assumptions, you know, you're a comedian, you must be the outgoing type, you know, you want to hang out, let's go for drinks, you'll be fun, a little party. I'm like, you know, if you got to know me, you realize I'm not the type of guy to go out partying. I'm not the type of guy, let's go for drinks. Very rarely, very rarely would you ever see me at a bar having a drink with a friend because I'm more of a dessert guy. Like, if you told me, let's go have a pint of ice cream, I'm like, let's do that. Let's do a whole pint and two if you want, right? I'm a big dessert guy. I, I go to buffets and I start backwards. I go to the dessert first, right? When everyone is fighting for the salmon or the, the, the salads and seafood, I'm like, <laughs> you amateurs, look at the tiramisu. It's fresh. It's fresh. I'm going first picks, you know? So I'm going that way. And it's a weird thing where, like, yeah, in its own way, you kind of look at it weird, like, oh, look at that guy going for dessert first. I'm like, you know what, dude? As much as you don't like it, I'm enjoying this dessert and I get first picks from it. So I'm having a good time. You have a good time. We're good with that. And I think that's what you touched upon is really important that the, the more we try to worry about how we fit in with the status quo and everything, the more we're going to be hard on ourselves because we're trying to fit into one criteria, which is these so-called pop criteria, right? The more general. It's like saying when you play a musical instrument, pop music, yeah, it's more popular. But maybe you don't enjoy it as much as you think you do, right? Sure, if you played pop music, you'd probably be more popular. But... You're on that stage looking at 10,000 people and you're playing a song you don't enjoy versus if you're a jazz musician and you really love jazz and you're in a lounge with 30 other people, but you're having a great time. You're like, man, you know what? I'll take this over any 10,000 people any day, right? Because I'm really in the moment enjoying, enjoying myself. And, and that's what you get to know yourself a lot is that 
through the times you're going through difficult things, that's when you really have to know who you are to get through it. Because you're, you're, you're your own partner. You're, you know, you're your own cheerleading team. So I think that's what a lot of people are saying over here. Uh, they're talking about resilience when life is daunting, you know. Uh, and I think, like, you, like we touched upon, Winnie, I mean, the both of us, in, the, in an odd way, is because we went through these hardships. Well, I wouldn't say hardships. I would say not fitting in and not being norm. It's kind of made us who we are now. And not to say we're not normal, but we've become who we are yeah. rather than who we should be, you know. We become who we want to be. And I think that's something that is not, you cannot buy that. You can't just, you know, have every, someone design it for you. This is something like a, your own journey where you have to go through that experience. It's like going to the gym and lifting that weight. No one can lift it for you. You need to lift it for your muscles to grow, right? And it sucks. It's, it's a, the weight is heavy. It hurts. I get it. But, you know, you need to go through that to get to where you want to be. If you want to be that, you know, that, that big buff guy. If you don't, hey, it's fine. Go meditate. So it's another way to work the game as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That, you, you're, you're, what you said reminds me of stigma. You know, stigma oftentimes is, is a social construction because if you are out of the norm or if you are out of the mainstream, then you'll be different and being different is being shunned upon and then you'll be stigmatized. So I think uh, why mental health is so stigmatizing, you know, in Hong Kong or mental illness is so stigmatizing is because people don't talk about it and people don't understand what it is. So that's why I think it's so important that to let people know what's going on, you know, how does it feel like, and, um, and, and a person is just another ordinary person with mental illness. So I think it's okay to talk about it and nothing to be ashamed of. And then hopefully we can eradicate that, that stigma. And not only for yeah. people with mental illness, but a lot of ment- different you know, social minorities are facing a, a tremendous stigma in Hong Kong. Um, whether you, because of your, uh, you know, your gender identity or because of your ethnic, ethnicity or, or what or not, not. And I think that's so important to, to break it away and then for, to share our story so then people understand that we're just ordinary people. And then hopefully, you know, in, in the stories people can relate to, you know, because there are, there are bound to be, you know, experience that people can relate to. Uh, we, we don't look, we are not as different as, you know, uh, as people think we are, you know, just because, yeah. we are, you know, we have a stigmatized identity. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And it, it's time and time again, I've, I've spoken to people and I don't blame anyone for having this misunderstanding slash stigma towards anyone, like say South Asian, comedian, you know, whatever it is. They assume that, oh, if you're this, you must be equal to that. I'm like, in a certain way, yes, but not completely, you know. It's like when people meet me and I'm like, yeah, I didn't eat curry for lunch. They're like, huh? But you're Indian. I'm like, yes, but, you know, I can eat other stuff too. You know, it, my digestion system is not unique to one race. It doesn't work that way, right? Then secondly as well, uh, I see a lot of questions asking about what can the general community do? You know, what can you do to be more resilient when life is daunting? You know, basically how can you get through your day when, you know, it just doesn't seem like a day you want to get through? And one thing I, I always do is every single day, every single day for the last, I think, like 10 years, I write a journal entry, right? Now, writing journals are very common. Okay, people write, no big deal. Ah, my day was terrible. I hate it. Like, ah, okay. But what I do like to do is every single day before I write my entry today, I review an entry I wrote one year ago. Now, if you're just starting, you can just review an entry you wrote last week. But what you'll find is that when you review what you did, let's say, a year ago and you compare where you are now, it's really mind-blowing because you kind of go like, wow, I've really progressed or, wow, I'm still doing that. You know, I've never, I've never broken that bad habit. It's been a year and I'm still doing that. You know, it kind of gives you your own little self-reflection. Not with you having to sit in the corner like, okay, who am I? What do I like? It's like, it's just there. That's something you wrote. And it excites you because whatever you write today, you know in a year's time, you're going to read that entry. So you definitely want to write an entry that you want to look forward to reading, right? So instead of every entry saying, oh, I woke up, didn't really want to wake up, but I woke up, but yeah, the sun, blah, blah, blah. They're like, hey, you know what? Let me write something a bit more fun for next next year. Because when I read that entry, I don't want to read the same entry every single day. So it kind of gives you that motivation again, that gamification of like, how can I have a good day that I'm going to write it down so one year later I can be excited and happy for myself that I went through that last year. Or it could be something that you you're, you're, you're hate. Like, you know, I'm nervous about a gig I'm doing. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm so scared. I'm, I'm, my, my palms are sweaty. And a year later, I look back and be like, wow, I can't believe I not only did that gig, I did two more of the same gigs as well and I'm fine, I'm still here. You know what? I can get through all this stuff. And that's one thing I tell people that helps me a lot. Basically, the journal entry and also the journal review. That's one thing that I feel helps me get through every single day because I know no matter how bad my day is, probably I went through something similar a year ago and guess what? I'm still here and I don't think I'm going anywhere anytime soon. Mm, That's a very good suggestion. I never thought about the, the journal review. 
And that reminds me of kind of like writing letters to yourself, you know, as if, you know, you are your dearest friend. So nowadays we don't write letters, but then let's imagine that you yourself is your dearest friend. So what would you say to yourself, you know? Yeah. And then mail it out. And then maybe three months later or, or, you know, a a day later, you receive it back and then read it again and see what, how does, how does that feel like? Absolutely. I think, I think that's one thing as well, because it's quite fascinating. You don't, you, you forget what you wrote, right? Maybe a mm-hmm. few months ago and you reread it you're like, wow, I can't believe that's what I said to myself three months ago. Yeah. I, I would have never imagined today. I would never say that to myself. And hey, you know what? That's progress. You know, you've improved. Or maybe I can't believe I said that to myself three months ago, but today I don't feel the same way. I'm like, well, then, you know, maybe you make some adjustments, see what changed. What happened to you in the last three months that changed your whole mindset completely? Because in three months, you changed this way. Imagine three months later, so much more can change as well, right? So we're, I think we're down to like, uh, we have around like five, seven more minutes left and we still have a few more questions coming in. People, oh, thank you. Man. A lot of people saying, Winnie, a lot of people are appreciating our sharing. They're enjoying what we're talking about and adding a little fun day. Hey, you know what? That's what we do. You know, some people sit around, you know, complaining. We just talk about going through cancer. So it's okay. You know, I went through cancer for you guys. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Anyway, let's see what else we've got real quick. Winnie, if there's any question you see that you stands out, just just pop it up and we'll work on that. Otherwise, I'm okay. going to quickly review everyone what they're saying. Yeah, I need to look at that too. All right, cool. So again, you know what? I'm going to do a little 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 quick fire answer for whatever I kind of feel is interesting. So how do you start your day when you feel like you just don't want to leave the bed now? This I totally understand. I totally get it. Some days you wake up like, oh man, just it's already it's already eight in the morning. Oh man, I ha- oh god, I don't want to do it. But look, put it this way. Uh, you're going to have some days where you really don't want to get out of bed, but the truth is usually the most challenging part is the first five minutes. It's the same with writing comedy. I can be very honest with you guys. I've done this for like, what, 13 years now? Every single time, every single day, whenever I sit down and say, okay, I got to write my comedy, I got to work on my comedy, the first 10 minutes are the worst where I'm like, oh man, I'm just, uh, my neck, uh, you know, I, I, let me tell you this. I will notice all the dust on my table whenever I have to write comedy. Because I'm like, you know what? My table's dusty. I'm going to clean my table first. Oh, wait, that's dusty. I'm going to clean that. I, all I need to do, I look at the clock and I say, oh, it's 10 a.m. now, right? By 10, 10 a.m., I'm going to be in the zone. So I just got to power through 10 minutes and trust me, it will just it'll start flowing. And that's one way I do. When I wake up, I'm like, I'm so tired now, but it's 8 o'clock now, but in 8, 10, I'm going to be awake. So let's just get out of bed, suffer for 10 minutes, and I'll be fine. And that's how I kind of push myself. I know 10 minutes and I'll be, I'll be in the zone already, ready to go. Let's see. Anything else? Have you experienced as a person an Indian in descent in Hong Kong affected your relationship with mental health today as an adult and growing up in youth? Yes, definitely. I mean, I would say not just Indian, but a lot of Asian descent. Right? I think the Asian culture around mental well being is still, you know, has a lot to catch up because there's still that idea of like, oh, so and so's son is going through this issue. Oh my God, you know, what's wrong with their son? So I think it's just that, that Asian culture has a mentality of like, who's, you know, doing better than me? Right? How is that family over there next door? You know, their son seemed to get this award. Our son got nothing. And I'm like, well, let's be very honest with you. Anyone can print a certificate. I always say, you want me to give you a certificate? I gave you 20 of them. I don't really care. You know, I can stick it on my wall. I'm great with Photoshop. But the point is that you might have 10 certificates, but you're not, you don't look at them with pride and look at them like, hey, you know, I earned that. Then it's irrelevant. I can give you all the trophies in the world. So whether it's someone's son gets a trophy is irrelevant. I can go compete in the competition with nobody else and I can still win the trophy. It, it takes me $40 to buy a trophy for myself. You know, nobody needs to know the, the re- reality behind it. So again, I think the, as an Indian person as well in Hong Kong, a lot of the community needs to catch up as well. And the good thing is the new generation is getting it, but it's still a long way to go. And I always feel that the best you can do is take care of yourself, regardless of your community. You know, be good to yourself, be kind to yourself. You're, you're your best partner. That's step number one. Yeah. And I think like, right. I like what you said, it's not about competition. It's about you're living your life. You're not competing against each other. You're not born to compete with other people. So, um, so just yeah. live your life the way you want to live. And yeah. And enjoy yeah. It. And, it, and that's the, the journal, journal review. You're at best competing with one year ago, you know, so you kind of not really competing, but, com- but trying to give yourself motivation of like, I was there one year ago in one yeah. year's time. I'm over here. Wow. You know, I would have never imagined. I'm so excited about what would happen a year later because you see the pattern, right? The growth that you're having. And that in itself is better than comparing yourself to the next guy, the next door neighbor or whoever your colleague is because it's relevant. There's, there are too many variables to compare on the same level. It's not fair, right? Mm-hmm. So instead of saying, oh, so-and-so read 10 books, you're like, you know what? I read two books, but you know what? I read one book last year and I read two books this year. So I'm already uh, twi- doubling my rate. So that's really good already. 
So that that's good enough to go. All right, we got two more minutes. When anything you see, just pop it up. I'm gonna quickly review as well. How would you review to? Uh, how would you respond to people who aren't understanding your stories? Hey, what about you, Winnie? Like, you know, how would you respond to people who are not un being understanding to your stories, or how to manage your emotions when you don't feel like they respond as expected? Anything you would like to share there? That's fine, because that's my story. No matter how people respond to it, I'm still. This is still my story, and then uh, so yeah, it's their exactly. problem, not mine. I think. I think that's something I learned as well as comedy that a lot of times, not to live in denial. I'm not trying to say totally ignore people, but this is this is it. This is my story. This is what I'm telling you. You you, you can ignore it, but the story doesn't change. It's just that yeah. your perception of it changes. And the moment you're okay with that, you realize it gives you a certain freedom that you're like, okay, that's fine. Don't listen to it. I said what I have to say. You know, at least I got it out of my system. Whether you received it is your problem now. Yeah. At the same time, I'm not trying to tell you just to talk to people and, you know, ignore them, but Right. Don't let people's response affect you and whether your story is fair or legitimate. Mm -hmm. But of course, strive to live an interesting life or even yeah. be able to tell better stories that people are like, wow, I really am fascinated by it. And that just is a double win for you. You get yeah. to tell your story and people want to hear it. And sometimes I think just uh, like you said, going back to like live an open mind. Like let's say, what do you expect? This sounds like you have expectations. People will react or respond to you in a different way. But what you get is you know surprising. And I think it's telling you something, you know. And then I think just just listen to that and then respond. And what does that mean? You know, why why I feel so so uh, activated about not getting the response that I I look for. And, yeah. and I think it's telling you something. And I think we just want to listen to that and, and see how that may may change the way next time you tell your story or, or a different story that you want to share with other people. Yeah. And, yeah. and at the end of the day, if everything fails, just always in your head. Keep in mind the power of the canned laugh track. <laughs> and life is good again. All right? Just have that ready to go at any moment. All right, I think uh, right now I'm looking at the time. We've just hit the two o'clock mark. I believe we're gonna. Look, we pretty much answered the the gist mm -hmm. of all the questions actually over here. Yeah. All right. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, I think we've pretty much covered everything. We we so I think Whitney, I think we've solved mental well being. You did. You did. <laughs> you both did. I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I think I take away uh, from a lot of what you both said about stigma. Um, and I think one of the things I, I attended a, uh, um, uh, another event, like uh, a live event last night, and one of the is uh, talking about to be seen. I think it's like minorities or, or, or you know, um, the others. Uh, sometimes the victory is just to be seen. And you both were today, and I truly, truly appreciate it. Um, because growing up as another, uh, as a Chinese in America, in recent, you know, with all the anti-Asian violence, I wrote something the other day in our newsletter, and I got back a pushback from somebody who just, thought I was, we were being, um, uh, uh, it was saying something negative and I, I took it to heart and I, I was uh, bothered by it. But I think what Winnie had said, um, it's our story and we're gonna stick to it. And uh, whether you like it or not, um, the, the, that's our story. And you both have been so um, articulate and I really, really appreciate it. Uh, in fact, this program reminds me of a program we did last Friday where we had a Holocaust survivor, Dr. Uh, uh, Edith Eager, who ended up uh, after surviving Holocaust, uh, Auschwitz at 16, ended up being a clinical psychologist in LA and has a wonderful career. And I think she's still going on 90. And I think the importance of psychology, important to mental health, uh, mental well being, cannot be stressed uh, enough in during this time of COVID. And I think we also, another thing I also take away, I want a copy of Winnie's uh, uh, King, the lesson. Um, I love that. That'll go to my. Uh, my backdrop the next the next time. Uh, it is really about listening and hearing each other, and that and that's how we're going to get through this this um, pandemic together. And in some ways, I look at what we've done this uh, year, this last year, Asia Society. A year ago, we started our COVID program, and never thinking that it was going to last over a year. Uh, but we have reached uh, audiences that are beyond our shore, beyond Hong Kong, and we made an impact. And I think it's through programs like this, it's not just the, the big global program, which is important to Asia society as well, but also through these conversations. Um, I think um, I think in some ways, if COVID, uh, anything positive come out of COVID, it's bought us time. Time for, uh, to, to be by ourselves. Yes, sometimes driving us crazy, but also time to hear each other. So I wanna thank you both. And I look forward to welcoming you guys back because we need to continue to listen uh, if we don't listen, I think we're going to keep on making the mistakes. And it's not just about working. 
uh, this is working. We're, we're working on listening to each other and working on building our community, um, a more resilient community uh, and also a more resilient self. So again, my heartiest uh, uh, gratitude to you both. And I want to thank uh, my team. Um, they have been really, uh, thanks to Ching and the team for putting together uh, this afternoon's program. And have a wonderful afternoon. And we look forward to welcoming you back uh, at future programs like this. And hopefully we'll welcome you back into uh, live programming as well in the near future. Thank you, Vivek. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.